Hello. Good morning, everyone. I just have got out of the shower, so I do have wet hair. I always have to make a comment. <laughs> Hello. It's um, Wednesday, and it's the 7th of July, and we're in chapter 22 of Joshua. Hi, Michelle. So today is, um, I've not been feeling well, I think some of you know that. Today's the day that I go see a doctor and get some uh, ball rolling maybe for some testing, but I do feel better today and I did feel much better last night, so I'm very thankful that I slept and um, that today seems to be going well so far. So praise the Lord. Every Every day is a gift, isn't it? Oh, there goes my phone. I'll turn that off. I'll wait to see if anybody else is going to jump on here. Good morning, Gail. We have two of you on, so we can get started here. It's 9.01. So yesterday we were in um, the first part of Chapter 22, and today we're going to finish Chapter 22. We're starting on page 55. And um, we're on verse 21. Um, yesterday we saw that um, an altar was built on the east side of the Jordan by three of the tribes, and um, this caused um, Phineas, the priest, to be sent over from the, um, sorry, on the east side they built an altar, and so the west side sent Phineas and um, people over to investigate. Good morning, Caitlin. And they they were just really, it had their panties in a bunch, so to speak, and were just not okay with the altar being built and um, came full force ready to have war. And, um, but at least they, you know, spoke to each other first and found out what was really going on before any start anything started to explode um, so let's start in verse 21 reading here um, and just we'll see how they resolved this uh, the Reubenites the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh answered the princes of the tribes of Israel Yahweh is the God of all gods Yahweh is the God of all gods we say it twice <laughs> we're trying to get their point across we appeal to God Almighty as our witness. <clears throat> he knows why he did, why we did this, and we want you to know too. If we rebelled or betrayed Yahweh, then you may take our lives today. But we built this altar with no intention of burning any kind of sacrifices on it. If we built this altar in rebellion against Yahweh or to break our covenant with him, then may Yahweh himself punish us. No, we love Yahweh. We were afraid that in the future your descendants will say to our descendants, Who are you? What right do you have to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel? He has placed the Jordan River as a barrier between our people and your people. You Reubenites and Gadites have no part in the worship of Yahweh, and your descendants may prevent ours from worshiping him. We did build an altar, but not for burning sacrifices or making offerings. We built this offer to show to our people and to your people and to the generations to come that we will worship Yahweh at his tabernacle. We will bring all our offerings into Yahweh's presence there so that your children may never say to our children in the future, you have no part in the worship of Yahweh. We have decided among us that if that day should ever come, our descendants would reply, See the replica of the altar of Yahweh, which our fathers made here at the border between us? Not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but as a witness that we both serve the same God. Far be it from us to rebel against Yahweh or to turn away from following him. This day, by building an altar on which to present offerings or make sacrifices to Yahweh our God, we would never build an altar to take the place of the altar which stands before his tabernacle, the place of his presence. This was a huge, big deal. Um, 
the altar represented his presence, and um, they're not. They're saying they're not trying to take away from it. They're not trying to divide them, so to speak. There was just supposed to be one place of worship, which was in Shiloh, and <coughs> they're just um, because they're divided by the Jordan River. I think they wanted to have their own place, like um, just an altar where they could uh, go to be with the Lord as well. <coughs> so they wanted uh, anyway we would never build an altar to take the place of the altar which stands before his, his tabernacle the place of his presence they're not trying to take away from the one at Shiloh they're saying when Phineas the priest and the princes of the tribes heard the explanation of the tribes of Reuben, Gad and East Manasseh they were satisfied Phineas, son of Eleazar, the priest said to them, Now we know that Yahweh is among us. Since you've not rebelled against him, you have indeed saved the Israelites from Yahweh's punishment. Then Phineas and the ten princes of the western tribes returned to the land of Canaan and told the people of Israel everything that happened. The outcome pleased the Israelites, and they praised God. They spoke no more of going to war against the eastern tribes to destroy the land where they had lived. The Reubenites and the Gadites called the altar witness, for they said, The altar stands as a witness to us that Yahweh is God. All right. So this is a, again, this is a really important thing because... <coughs> This is where they define themselves, so to speak. This is where they um, carry on with their beliefs uh, in God, in Yahweh. And so um, it felt like someone or the, these three tribes were trying to split them or um, actually they were concerned that they were going to be um, burning incense or burning or sacrificing animals and such, um, bringing offerings to something or someone other than Yahweh. And so that couldn't be, and so that's why they came to check it out. Um, in verse 18, when they were asking, I'm looking down in the notes now, this is before um, where we were reading today. Let me go back to that. It says, How dare you turn back from following Yahweh? If you rebel against him today, he will be angry with everyone in Israel tomorrow. So they had lots of memories. We talked about this yesterday of how Achan, um, when they went into Jericho, how Achan took some of the gold and silver and then that caused himself and others to die. So they knew that they had to be obedient to the Lord. And um, in verse 18 in the notes, it says that they were asserting that the altar constituted a rebellion against God and against the unity of the nation, which was to worship Yahweh at Shiloh. The centralization of the worship of God's people was at stake. And collective guilt can be a plague on the moral conscience of a nation. Um, I wrote down something in the notes here that um, came to mind when I read this several days ago. Um, because of Brian Simmons' note here that says collective guilt can be a plague on the moral conscience of a nation. And it made me wonder about cities that have definite strongholds. In particular, I was thinking about San Francisco and California and how um, the stronghold of um, homosexuality and all its variants is, it's like a ruling spirit there. And so I was thinking, what breaks down the moral conscience of a people group in a city or a region that could bring about the very noticeable stronghold and all of the um, demonic uh, entities that would begin to be able to rule there, they collect there because of um, the moral conscience of the people disintegrating. And I thought, um, 
I just was wondering, I was asking the Lord, how does a stronghold start in an area? And I think con the conscience of each person has to be um, waning. I don't know what the word is. <coughs> Where, where they don't have, like, a thought to repent anymore. A hardened heart begins in each person. And how that collects. And, um, and he spoke here of collective guilt can be a plague or bring on a plague. And I was just thinking how the collection of all that guilt and all of that sin becomes a hub for um, a plague, so to speak, of sin to rule in an area. And so if, if the love of God could penetrate through there and the forgiveness of the Lord could penetrate into those hearts, would that begin to break up that stronghold? I don't know, it's just some just a rabbit trail of thought there that I have for a while. I don't know what you guys think about that, but there are definitely whole nations, like in Europe, whole nations that are given to uh, maybe more of an atheistic viewpoint, of a godless viewpoint or whole nations that believe that it, it euth, uh, euthanizing people is, is really gracious and merciful. How do those types of thought patterns become a stronghold? Yeah, callous and hardened hearts. So all of us are just, you know, so capable of sharing the love of God we have to experience it ourselves. We have to be assured of it, something that I'm still pressing into, of the love of the Lord to be able to share it with other people authentically. And um, anyway, I just wanted to share that. I had thoughts about that and about family and about how, um, how God has made the family unit and how the family unit has broken down and um, that the family unit is what it holds the fiber of the nation together. Um, I won't go into a word that I, gave, I felt like the Lord gave me yesterday. There's a time for me to deliver that, but just all of these things um, were stirring about in my heart when I thought about how people stray from their commitment to the Lord because in verse 24 and 25 it says no we love Yahweh no what we're trying to say is we love Yahweh and we're we're thinking of our descendants we're thinking of our grandchildren and we just we don't want your grandchildren coming to our grandchildren and saying you know what's up with this why are you separating our nation and our our um, worship. Um, so one thing I wanted to bring up too is that it says down in the notes that they did forget actually what God had accomplished for them. Um, the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half tribe of Manasseh, because in 1 Chronicles 5, 25 and 26, um, it's, I'll read it to you. It's kind of sad that they they went and prostituted themselves. This is four centuries later. Um, so I think that means 400 years later approximately. In First Chronicles 5.25, it says, But they were unfaithful to the God of their ancestors and prostituted themselves to the gods of the peoples of the land whom God had destroyed before them. So the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, king, um, that is Tiglath, Pileser, king of Assyria, who took the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh into exile. He took them to Hala, Habor, Hera, and the, the river of Gozan where they are to this day. So they actually went into exile um, 
because they forgot this uh, witness, this portion here, um, let's read the very last portion again. Um, Then Phinehas and the ten princes of the western tribes returned to the land of Canaan and told the people of Israel everything that happened. The outcome pleased the Israelites, and they praised God. They spoke no more of going to war against the eastern tribes to destroy the land where they had lived. The Reubenites and the Gadites called the altar witness, for they said the altar stands as a witness to us all that Yahweh is God. And uh, they did forget, is what I was trying to say in First Chronicles. They did forget what God had done for them, and they were um, unfortunately led into exile. Yes, the root of any stronghold is idolatry, hardened hearts, and false refuges, yes. Oh, so how does the heart get hardened? How does the heart look into a false refuge? How does the heart go after things that are not the Lord and are idols instead? That's the place we want to get to with people to help them to stay away from that place and then to collectively lead them out and unloosen these strongholds. <clears throat> I wanted to pray this morning for the coming generations, should the Lord tarry. I just wanted to bless um, our lineages with the ability to know God and to believe in Him and to believe in His name and to live for Him. Um, looking forward like we just did in First Chronicles um, and, and to see that they forgot when, you know, they're the people right there at that moment with Phineas, you know, said, no, we love Yahweh. That's what I want to pray into, that, um, uh, that God would preserve our lineage and that they would always cry out to him and always want to be uh, walking with him. So let's just pray for a minute. I just... Lord, I thank you for this chapter. I thank you for how you are showing us how to reconcile with people, how to talk things through, how to explain where we're, why we're doing things that can look so threatening to other people. I thank you, Lord, that Phineas and those with him were satisfied, and in their hearts that meant that they had your peace and they knew that what had been done was not an affront to you. I thank you, Lord, that we can take care of one another in this way. I thank you for confrontation. I thank you for loving people in a way that asks questions and doesn't just assume or believe things that they've heard that are not true. I thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us how to communicate I thank you that you're teaching us how to believe the best in each one. I thank you, Lord, that you are teaching us how to talk to one another in a peaceful way. Thank you for the gift of communication that is rooted in the love of God. And we just pray right now. We come into agreement and declare that those that go... Um, ahead of us, into or, or behind us, I mean, that will be coming up after us, um, that they will know you, that you are the one true God, and that they will serve you all the days of their life, starting with our children and then our children's children. Lord, we pray into these generations that they will stand up and say, yes, we love Yahweh. Yes, we want to serve him. Yes, he is our God. We give and declare and strengthen them in the spirit, Lord, even to our, our uh, grandchildren's children, 
We thank you, Lord, that going into uh, the next several years, Father, in any <laughs> way that the enemy would want to steal, rob, kill, or destroy their faith, we thank you that their faith is secured by our prayers right now. We declare that they are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that they have um, come into their inheritance, that they walk with you and with no other gods calling or beckoning to them. We thank you that they walk strong and true with soft hearts towards you at all times, always willing to be corrected and having a spirit of humility. We bless our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren with these responses to you, Father. Their, their spouses, their children, all the people that will be important in their tribes, their clans, their people groups, Lord. We pray for a ring of fire around them called the Holy Spirit and that you would uh, give them your presence as they go through their lives. And we call them into this world <coughs> with your presence on them, with your mark on them, in Jesus' name. And we bless them and their worship of you that is pure and undefiled and, and glorious, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Have a great day. And take care. I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. We'll be in chapter 23. All right. Bye-bye.